From Rhythm and Light in Chicago, I'm Steve Ordauer, and welcome to Rhythm of Life. Today on the show, I sit down with an actor who has been a fixture on the film and television landscape for decades. You may know him from the Ghostbusters, Miss Congeniality, the HBO series Oz, The Crow, or a slew of other productions. But today, you will get to know him in a very personal way as we explore his long and winding career. So sit back and enjoy this thoughtful, fascinating, inspiring, and at times downright hilarious conversation I had with this American treasure, who is one of the most gracious and thoughtful people I know, and happens to be a very dear friend of mine, Mr. Ernie Hudson. We haven't gotten here by accident. I mean, that that Mm. school I went to, you know, I was able to sort of come out of it, but most of those kids, almost all those kids, they they, mm-hmm. they got lost, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. did not have great lives. And But, I, you know, it, it's needed. It, whether we'll step up to the reckoning without going mm-hmm. to civil war, I mean, mm-hmm. whether we'll see there's a need and maybe we personally mm-hmm. might not have, you know, uh, a, a reason to say, you know what, we need to be inclusive. Um, we we we're, we're all in this together. That sense of unity as Americans, of course, now with the whole social media and the internet and all that uh-huh. stuff. I mean, they're playing with our minds and trying to control and all that. Oh my but gosh! We, you know, I don't know how we overcome this new place we're at, but I think we have to. And the thing with African American movies and some of the stuff they're doing, these stories have not been told. They need to be told. <laughs> yes, to yes. Them. But I, 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 I the the whole. Uh, angst and, and and some of the the tragic stuff. We we didn't survive with just the tragedy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. People loved and laughed. And I just trusted the universe. Uh, the Holy Spirit would guide mm-hmm. me there. I didn't know how. I didn't know anybody. I didn't never knew an actor. Um, never met an actor, but I just knew that. Mm-hmm that uh, it, it's in the asking. And of course you have to prepare yourself and all that, but so there was never a doubt sure, in my mind, a question that I would be successful. The problem was, I I think I, I pray the, well, not the wrong prayer. I, I should have added to that prayer, I want to make a lot of money, you know? <laughs> You know, when you ask, I just, I just want to work. I want to, I want to work. If you can just let me work in this industry, you know, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll honor it and I'll be so thankful. I should have said and make a lot of money. I forgot to put the money. (laughs) I'm sorry. I forgot how funny you were. I was doing a play in LA. Uh, I met Michael, didn't know him. Actually, he was at a party and I just sort of went up and, and introduced myself and, and asked if he would introduce me to his agent, which he looked um, at me like, what, you know, I don't even know you. But uh, I guess because I had the audacity to ask, you know, and I asked very sincerely because why wouldn't he? And uh, he said, okay. Of course. So so he called his agent and the agent gave me an appointment to go see him in Beverly Hills. I went into Beverly Hills and I was intimidated to be in Beverly Hills. Uh, parked, and then I went in to see this guy and waited and waited and waited, and finally he came out to call me in the office. And before I could say anything, he says, listen, the only reason I'm seeing you is because Michael is one of my best clients, and he asked me to see you. So I saw you, so now you can leave. And I said, oh but I'm, you know, I'm new, and I was trying to give him my little spiel. And he said, I don't want to hear that. He said, I don't want to hear it. Uh, I tried to show my portfolio. He says, I don't want to see that shit. Uh, he says, I get this, oh I get this God. shit in the mail every day. And he held up his waste <laughs> basket and it had a bunch of photos that actors had sent in. And he says, I, and so I said, well, cause I asked, can I give you my picture in case something comes up? He said, what, what, what am I going to do with that? So he says, best thing you can do is go back to Detroit or wherever the hell you come from, uh, because you're not going to work out here. I can tell you that now there's no, there's nothing for you here. Today, guest host Bob Hercules sits down with the prolific author, journalist, and filmmaker, Alex Kotlowitz. When I had finished the bulk of the reporting, I went through this um, kind of really deep depression, unlike Mm. anything I've ever experienced before. And I wasn't kind of self-aware enough to realize what was going on, but I realized, in hindsight, I mean, I went into therapy I needed Mm. to, um, was that it had so much to do with all these stories that I had 
um, digested over the course of the previous few years. Mm. Um, I mean, for me, the great catharsis I had, of course, is I was able to take pen to paper and tell these stories. Right, and, right. And there's something really empowering about um, like your father had done many years about earlier about his to own get it out on right. paper is cathartic. Yeah, yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's a it's a brave uh, book to have taken on. Uh, and I, again, don't mean to take anything away from the trauma that they experienced, but for you as well, it's difficult. Um, but I'm so glad you, made, you wrote this book because, again, it gives us an insight. All we, hear, uh, all we hear about is, you know, this person was killed in a shootout or this and that, and we, we don't know right, who and, these people are. Right, and more often than not, you know, you read stories that some, it was gang-related, suggesting right. that, you know, the victim would kind of got their due or what goes around comes around. Or we just have these stories or headlines of numbers like we're in a pennant race, you know, right. and we kind of forget – uh, about these individuals. I want privacy 18. You know what I'm saying? Because I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a game banger. I ain't going to lie. I'm keep it real with you. Silas Ratcliffe and Maurice Childress are both 16. Both are associated with a gang and say they wouldn't be surprised if they were shot today. Just walking down the street, you never know. Walking down, down the street, you never know. It just be your time to go. Right. It, 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 all, you always gotta look behind, turn it your back. Bullets ain't got no name, no name. They might want to kill me, and then they end up killing you, 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 and you, and not killing me. The kids are matter of fact about the things they do and what they've seen. I've seen people get shot, killed, robbed, stabbed. I've done some of that, all that. It's just crazy. According to Chicago police, the murder rate here is up 35% compared to last year. People living here say the gangs have taken over. Some say they'd like to see the National Guard come in. We need help. You know, you need help. That's all I, that's the only way I can put it. Maurice and Silas say there are no jobs and people have no idea how hard it is to survive. Also, to recognize that it doesn't go away. It's no. not, you know, you lose a loved one. It's not like a week from now you're walking around and beginning to experience all this joy again. Right. And you've right. got to, the other thing about it is, unlike veterans returning from combat, you got to look over your shoulder and worry about what's going to happen next. That's right. Hailed by NPR as one of America's defining voices of freedom and peace, Mavis Staples is an iconic artist whose impact on culture continues to reverberate. She's both a blues and a rock and roll hall of famer, a civil rights icon, a Grammy award winner, and a chart-topping soul gospel R&B pioneer. She marched with Dr. King, performed at John F. Kennedy's inauguration, and sang in Barack Obama's White House. She's collaborated with a wide array of notable artists such as Prince, Bob Dylan, and Ry Cooter. Well, Uncloudy Day took off. It took off, and it just, she said, Staples, this, this record is selling like an R&B. And we began getting letters from all over, everywhere. I was singing bass on this, this song. You know, we'd sing down in harmony. Oh, they tell me. Oh, the So we knew that the people had bet their money that I was not a little girl. We were fooling. My brother was singing. And we'd sing the song down to get came to my party. And Purvis would ease in to the microphone like he was going to say the bass part. And the people would go, wow, I told you that wasn't no little girl. I told you. <laughs> and they going through all that. I'd ease in. And then I would come, well, 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 oh, well, well. Well, oh, yes, so yes, they tell me. No, they tell me no. So yes, they tell I, me. I got a home. Yes, so yes, got a home. They tell me. Be up the sky. So yes, well, well, oh, yes, so yes, they tell me. the people. The, the oh, disc jockeys would say, this is little 14-year-old Mavis Staples singing oh, on Cloudy Day. People would not believe I was a little girl. I bet they didn't. I had to be either a man or a big fat lady. <laughs> so we would fool the people. 
you know, man, the place would go wild. I bet it did. They would go, they just, because I was a little skinny girl. A critic once said, give John Langford four hours with nothing to do, and chances are good he'll create another side project. I mean, we got quite good with minimal resources at at actually putting on some kind of exciting show, but literally it was all backwards. Rather than having a solo, someone would drop out. Right. You know, so that's what the Gang of Four perfected that as well. It was like, that was like a dub reggae thing, you know, Yeah. rather than some, like, add something else on top at this point. Right, the bass player drops out. Those were the kind of dynamics. They were very simple, but they were very effective. You had to be, I think the first gig with the Rosillos I was talking about, mm-hmm. we, the, the John Keenan actually, we told him we, we only played slow songs. Uh-huh. We were going to be the first punk band that only played <laughs> slow songs. And he just went, well, you better speed them up or they'll tear you apart. <laughs> Before he left our studio, John performed a brand new song that he had just written, a fitting song for the divisive times we're in. The mission is to frighten and confuse you, distract and call you losers. You're all losers. 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 Now we're all losers. Today in the studio, we welcome the prolific filmmaker, Bob Hercules. Primarily focusing on documentaries, his latest project, Maya Angelou and Still I Rise, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and went on to win 19 awards on three continents. The film aired on PBS's American Masters and most recently was awarded a Peabody for Excellence in Broadcasting. We discussed this film with Bob along with the rest of his illustrious career. We may encounter many defeats, but we must not be defeated. That in fact it may be necessary to encounter defeats so we can know who the hell we are. There was one clip that, I mean, the whole film struck me. It was a wonderful piece, and congratulations Thank on you. it. But there was one piece in particular where she was speaking in front of a crowd of people, audience maybe 70, 100 people, what mm-hmm. have you. She was talking about this, I think a woman who worked a service job as a maid or oh, something yeah, like this, right. uh, a single mother, and she laughed, but she wasn't really laughing. Right. I have uh, written a poem for a woman who rides a bus in New York City. She's a maid. She has two shopping bags. When the bus stops abruptly, she laughs. If the bus stops slowly, she laughs. I thought, "Mm, mm-hmm, uh-huh. Now, if you don't know black features, you may think she's laughing. But she wasn't laughing. She was simply extending her lips and making a sound. (laughs) I said, oh, I see. That's that survival apparatus. Now, let me write about that to honor this woman who helps us to survive. 70 years in these folks' world, the child I works for calls me girl. I say, <laughs> yes, ma'am, for working sake. I'm too proud to bend and too poor to break. So <laughs> I laugh until my stomach ache when I think about myself. As I'm watching this film, I kept thinking, what did you take away from this experience? Mm. How has this enriched you personally? Mm. 
Well, I learned some things from her. I mean, forgiveness is one mm. of her main things that she was always advocating, forgiveness mm. and reconciliation. So I've always been a believer in that. Mm. But listening to her idea of it and her commitment to it really was, was very strong and solid. So it was something I learned a lot from her. The other thing I got from her was, well, we call the film And Still I Rise, which is from one of her famous poems. And I think about how inspiring her story is that she was came from this low level from being a black woman in the Jim Crow South and mm-hmm. being a woman in a white man's world and having been raped when she was eight and all the crap you go through and yet to rise above that. She was not bitter at all. She took that and made what she could of it. And she used, I think she, um, I guess I would say had grace. That was her strongest. Personified. Yeah. Oh. Her, she had tremendous grace in the face of such adversity. It was remarkable and it was inspiring to me. Today on the show, Bob Hercules sits down with attorney Flint Taylor to discuss the murder of Black Panther leader Fred Hampton in 1969, who is the subject of the recent film, Judas and the Black Messiah. All of these leaders and organizations were very powerful in the civil rights movement and in the black liberation struggle. So Hoover then sent out memos in in 67 and again in early 68, uh, calling for disruption and, quote, neutralization of these leaders and these organizations. And of course, we learned that neutralization is a term and was a term of art. A CIA used it. Uh, and that could mean uh, several things, but it included, of course, assassination. Hmm. Um, and uh, that they named not only the organizations uh, from SCLC um, all the way to the Nation of Islam and, and SNCC and, and, and uh Rap Brown and his organization, but they named those leaders as messiahs who could electrify and unify the black nationalist m- movement. Uh, and uh, they then sent this, Hoover sent out this memo saying we need to neutralize these leaders and these organizations and prevent the rise of a messiah uh, who could uh, um, do this uh, in the sense of could um, electrify and unify the movement. So we say, we always say to the Black Panther Party that they can do anything they want to us. We might not be back. I might be in jail. I might be anywhere. But when I leave, you can remember I said with the last words on my lips that I am a revolutionary. And you're going to have to keep on saying that. And so Fred Hampton fit into that category soon after these memos went out. And of course, the second memo went out in early 1968, only a month before Dr. King was assassinated. Hmm. Um, And when they named the messiahs, uh, they named King, uh, they named uh, Rap Brown, they named Stokely, uh, they named um, Malcolm, even though he was already dead at that point, assassinated as well. And they didn't name Fred, uh, but he fit that uh, category. And, of course, uh, when the Panthers became uh, stronger and their leadership became stronger, then those leaders, and particularly Fred, became a messiah who uh, was targeted and ultimately assassinated by uh, the FBI and local police here. This is your friend, your client, somebody you had a lot of uh, faith in, and he was, it was a murderous r- rampage, really. I, I'm sorry to ask you, but what was this like for you personally to walk into that house? Well, I was basically a, the same age as Fred Hampton, but of course from a very different background. Uh, and a bit naive. Uh, so to walk in to the apartment, of course, the first thing was was shock. You know, you hmm. you there was blood on the on, on the floor outside of the apartment, uh, 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 the room that Fred Hampton had uh, been asleep and murdered in, because his body had been been dragged off of the bed and and, and laid uh, on, on the floor there. Uh, there were bullet holes. This was a, a, a very small uh, apartment with with, with uh, plasterboard walls, uh, sir, um, uh, uh, you know, d- dividing very very tiny bedrooms, right. so that 
you could see bullet holes, which in fact were, were made by a machine gun uh, that uh, basically made the walls look like Swiss cheese in mm. terms of the holes. It was, uh, it was extremely shocking. Uh, it was hard to, on the one hand, really comprehend uh, the enormity of the crime that, that you were witnessing, but it was, in, in, in fact, a murder scene, a crime scene. Yeah, uh, an assassination scene, and I think uh, the fact that uh, we we shifted so quickly from shock to uh, the kind of adrenaline-driven work mm -hmm. uh, of of you know cataloging all of the bullets that were on the floor, and bullet shells, and 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 and, and all the um, bullet holes. We didn't know what you know exactly. Uh, which pieces of evidence would be the ones uh, that would uh, be the most important. Uh, we did know that uh, the front door was an important piece of evidence because they had started uh, saying that there was one bullet hole and it was the one that showed that the Panthers started it for, because it went from the inside to the outside. Oh, right. And so we... Um, and Skip particularly um, went to that door panel, saw there were two holes, one going in and one going out, mm. uh, and he uh, then had the pictures uh, and the video taken of the panel in the door, and then we took the panel out of the door and we transported it to a ballistics expert uh, in upstate New York uh, to be analyzed. Wow. And um, there were several things that were very uh, cloak and daggerish, and and and, and uh, very much uh, remained in my mind. We, the, the the police had said Rush is next because Bobby Rush was not in the apartment. Hmm. We thought they might be coming back to the apartment, so we were like um, operating under a certain amount of fear that actually we might be raided as, wow. and, and, and arrested for what we were doing. Um, we. We were taking the evidence every night to uh, churches, and we wouldn't necessarily know where we were going until we were told. Uh, and then we'd go to the back door of the church, uh, and um, a minister would let us in, and we'd go up uh, a, a stairs, a set of stairs to the attic, and that's where we would stash the evidence for safekeeping each night. And, and, and the Panthers, the bloody mattress that, that Fred was murdered on, um, they would take it and lock it up every night, and then uh, every morning they'd bring it back and put it in its place so when they did the tours, they could point to it and say, this is the, the, the mattress that Fred was murdered on. What inspired you to get into acting and, and writing to begin with? You know, uh, I got married so young, uh, I thought it would be very simple, get a job, take care of your family, buy a house, and, you know, how hard can it be? <laughs> so, <laughs> but it got complicated oh, real man. fast. I used to have those, I used to have those same thoughts. You know, Boy, and, were uh, we naive. Hey, man, much love. Thank you so much, oh, Ernie. Pleasure. Thank you. Best to the family. Take care. Thank you for tuning into the show. If you're a fan of Ernie Hudson, make sure to check out his riveting performance in The Man in the Silo, available on Amazon Prime Video. Columnist Rick Kogan of the Chicago Tribune wrote, It is a love story, ghost story, and psychological thriller, all playing out under the shadow of racial tension and backed by Bernard Herrmann's haunting score for Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. And if you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. Leave us a rating and review so more people can hear about us and share about Rhythm of Life on social media and like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening. I'm Steve Ordower. This has been a Rhythm and Light production.